Big Daddy Linux is sponsored by UpCloud, which can provide you with superior cloud hosting and cloud infrastructure with unrivaled performance with their Max IOPS technology. Sign up using the promo code Big Daddy Linux, which gives you $25 worth of credit along with a seven day free trial to see for yourself the UpCloud difference. And welcome to another Biddle on Saturday night, June 22nd. How is everybody doing? Doing good. Very good. well, thank, thank you. Just fine. Well. Well. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Fantastic. All right. So first things first here, um, <clears throat> you might have heard a 20-second sponsor ad for UpCloud. And this channel doesn't always have sponsors. It doesn't have sponsors because we kind of are picky and choosy with being having sponsors. Um, but what we are going to do is I'm going to talk to Eric about UpCloud because what we're going to do is we are going to take the BigDaddyLinks.com website and we are going to move it to UpCloud. Eric? Nice. Hey, Rocco. What's up, Cloud? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you do it? Okay. That's, that's terrible, funny. dude. That is so terrible. <laughs> I know. I know. I feel better. I had to say it. Uh, yeah. So um, when Rocco mentioned that UpCloud was going to be a sponsor and they provided a extended trial with a $25 credit, this is something I already do. So I host websites for folks. I use uh, Vulture, DigitalOcean, uh, and now I'm hosting some things on upcloud as well and so based on my previous experiences i just wanted to see how does that compare uh, packages pricing performance control panel kind of all the things you would expect to look at and yeah i mean it was very easy very straightforward i actually wasn't even home i was on my laptop out and about and able to do it uh, within about a half an hour or so i had a site up and running so um yeah, I mean, it's it's it definitely seems like a, a great option. I'm going to be testing it more over the coming weeks. And like Rocco said, we're going to put a copy of the site to start with. And what we want to do is show the difference between he's, he's using like a budget host right now, shared hosting, and compare that to the performance on UpCloud. I'll tell you just, I've already created a, an instance there for testing, and I'll tell you that uh, the theme editor he's using in WordPress takes about, 10 to 15 seconds to load on his current hosting and about two seconds to load on upcloud so you know it's there's obviously a performance benefit there and this is using the the lowest tier single core one gig of memory so it isn't even like a super beefy machine it's just uh you know it's the only thing running on it so it's looks pretty good so far i'll be able to report back as we uh, move through it and and uh, so thanks to upcloud for the 25 dollars and the seven day trial so yep. there you go. Nice. So we're putting our money where our mouth is and testing it out to see how good this service is. It seems really good. So if you guys want to check it out, give us feedback, let us know. All right. Um, distro challenge. I hate to say it, but we did Puppy Linux and where is prophetic? <laughs> Maybe he's like Michael and you say Puppy Linux enough. You all have <laughs> <laughs> well, I just don't understand. Three times, three times in sequence, and then it'll show up. He, I mean, Puppy he. Linux, Puppy Linux, Puppy Linux. Wait no, a second. Wait a second. No, he didn't show up. Um, <laughs> Adam did donut, but Adam, <laughs> Adam showed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, I did not get a chance with self and everything trying to get caught back up again with uh, Linux Spotlight and, you know, daily life, uh, I didn't have time to test Puppy Linux. But I'm going to say that I like Puppy Linux. And there's one reason why I like it. I don't know anything other than the fact that it's it's single click by default. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> so it's good in my book. <laughs> <laughs> now, the one area I didn't like. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Zeb, did you get to try Puppy Linux? Um, I didn't this time round. I have tried it in the past when EB did a very good tutorial. I think it was on, um, I can't pronounce the name, Teha or something, uh, whichever version of it that was. And he put it on a 16 gig USB and it installed and it ran really well. And I like the idea that it could have storage outside of itself. 
So the so that it the core that you still loaded into memory was really really small, but then you could have all these packages sitting outside of it somehow. I don't know how it works, but this video from English Bob is really really good, and it ran um, and it ran for about three months on the USB. Then I needed to install a uh, something else, so Puppy went next. Well, I did notice that they do have some type of setup. Uh, welcome screen type thing where it gives you quite a few options and I was like for a for just a a distro that runs on a USB that's actually pretty that's actually pretty good that they put that in there so because there are other major distros that don't have that so um Eris I know you love puppy we can tell <laughs> <laughs> well puppy Linux is uh, I think more than it seems for a lot of people I, I don't really understand it all myself because it's like very complicated when it comes down to it. I know that you can use Puppy Linux, uh, install it or use it for, in four ways. You can use Puppy from the burn USB you have and it saves your settings. You can also install Puppy in another drive, in another USB drive. Or you can use it as um, the, the file system or like compressed images. And you can run those and, and save them in any partition without devoting the whole partition to it. And then you have to uh, use the grub for dust um, booter. Or you can just install it like a regular distro um, and and just use grub. Install grub or use a, another partition to use that grub. Um, Puppy, I think I, th I think the way that the video I, I, I put on Telegram describes it is it's the philosophy of how to build a distro. You can build Puppy on any uh, many different distros. Of course, there's that the the Ubuntu one, the Bionic Pup. There's also the the Slackware one, Slacko, and they use the Wolf system in order to build the Puppy Linux distro. Um, and I think it's very interesting uh, that they use a layered file system in which uh, they save all, all your st all your changes in the Pup RW section, and that allows you to save everything you do in just one file. And it, it also allows you to change software that's running on Puppy without rebooting. You can you can uh, drop one uh, one image into it and then take it off without rebooting your computer and completely change the software stack on it. And or you can also have it so that let's say you, you need to uh, give it to somebody to use the computer, you can enable it so that it doesn't save anything, and they can use the computer. And then once you come back, you turn that you turn that back on and. Then, Everything they did was all erased. There's no trace of whatever they did. So a good use case for it might be to do like online banking, maybe? Yeah, that they, they specifically said that in that video I, I, uh, I posted on Telegram, that that's a use case. You can you can uh, do all your, all, your back, uh, all your updates and then just do a stateless um, uh, setting for Puppy and nothing saved. That would be something that I would use. Uh, I wouldn't obviously use it as a distro to install, but that would be a good use case for it. Yeah. Um, as far as Puppy like running, I, I think it's just incredibly light how how much stuff is in there. I mean, it might not be like the main like applications that everybody knows, but you have like an image editor, you have web browsers, you have a torrent client, you got a download manager, uh, you got Gparted, all these settings. I mean, all these applications. And it's only 354 megabytes. It's kind of incredible how, how little the the size of it is. Yeah, you do have like Abby Word and uh, what is it? Abby Word too. Yeah. Gnumeric or Gnumeric or however you would you say it. Claws Mail was on there, um, and Pale Moon was the the web browser. Yeah, and um, and it, and then when you run it from USB, it's only 216 megabytes. And if you do a full install. Like I did, you only get 170 me me uh, 170 megabytes of use, and that's it. So, so I, th I think it's it's very interesting. I mean, I wouldn't use it because I think everybody knows the Achilles heel of puppy is you run its root, and they try to uh, not uh, maybe vulnerable by by creating this uh, spot uh, user, and that uh, has uh, not all privileges uh, like a root user, but I mean that. I, that I don't like, and that's probably why I wouldn't use it as my main distro. And I think that's about it for me, uh, about Puppy. All right. Uh, Carlos, did you get to try it? Uh, no, actually, I'm in the throes right now of putting uh, 
uh, open SUSE on my main box, which is a, a chore because I have to do lots of backups before I try anything. So uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to give Puppy a try, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. Your tips help, by the way. <laughs> Glad to hear. All right. So, Vash, did you try Puppy Linux? I only got to mess with it a little bit in the VM, um, but I did take away some things pretty quickly. Uh, one thing that I really didn't like was there is no, you know, hit the Windows key and start typing. You can't do that. And I mean, I, I get it because ultimately it's probably it's running in RAM. So it doesn't really make sense to have an index or whatever it needs to actually do that. But it was just kind of, you know, that's the way I typically drive computers. So I'd really have to uh, adjust on that. Um, one thing that stood out there was just overall, I felt like it really looked pretty slick for what it was. Like that that's something that kind of threw me off. Um, I, I did the uh, Bionic Pup uh, and just, you know, did the 64 bit. There were, uh, it was kind of cool. They had a, you know, the firewall button down in the bottom corner, like in the system tray where you just can turn it on, turn it off. I thought that was pretty useful. Um, they had, uh, what was the other thing? There was another icon down there as well that I, I thought would be pretty nice if other distros considered adding but like overall i thought the looks were pretty slick uh very simple but you know it was clean and i'm like i like that um i like that you could right click and get to a lot of different options there in the uh, i guess the application menu or something like that uh just right clicking around the desktop and you know it seemed pretty fast even in vm so i'd have to uh, spend more time with it but based on my just, you know, messing around with it, it seems like it'd be something that would be, could be useful on a, you know, a really older PC or as, you know, something like banking or something like that to just, you know, play around with something different. Mm -hmm. So quick question. When I noticed when I was looking for it, there seemed to be a number of different variations of Puppy. So it'd be interesting to see which ones people installed because I was too confused as to, which was the original and which were derivatives, if that makes sense. So which one were you running, Vash? You still there, Vash? I was running uh, I was running Bionic. Um, I considered trying out Xenial, but I just didn't have the time, unfortunately. But that was mm -hmm. I was planning to look at both of them at some point, but I just I just didn't get the chance. I know mm -hmm. uh, E B talked about Xenial not too long ago and seemed to really like it. Cool. Thank you very much indeed. Dark one. Okay. Uh, How did you get on with Puppy? Uh, Puppy Linux is hello, Tesla. Has been a longtime friend and a longtime enemy all at the same time. <laughs> um, I love it for older hardware. Um, I love the fact that you can load it into RAM and live USB. Take your pick. It, I, you know, when pen drive Linux was a thing. Um, and you had to use that as your guide to actually oh, install stuff to yes. a pen drive. Okay. Um, I use the Bionic version. Uh, I didn't really get a chance to install it, so I just ran it from uh, thumb drive. Uh, it worked great, light. Uh, everything worked out of the box, even on my weird Sony Vio Duo thing that GNOME distros can't seem to run. Um, very light, very snappy. Uh, I pseudo went through the install process just to see how it was set up. Um, I thought that was actually pretty pretty slick and pretty minimal for a, a very minimalist distro. Um, a lot of stuff comes with it, though, which is goes to show that you don't always need the heaviest applications for things, which is something sometimes I think people forget. Mm -hmm. so, uh, overall, I, I think it was a great distro for what it is. Um, not a daily driver for me, though. No, I don't, I don't think it was uh, ever built to be a daily driver, just a, a really useful ad hoc tool to have on a USB key. Uh, it depends. It depends on your your look on it. Yeah, if you're using it on an older machine, it's going to be a daily driver. Mm, okay. Yeah, that, that's kind of my take on it. And most of my machines are not that old. So. That old, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. Colin, I know you tried it because I've seen your video on it, mate. Yes, I, uh, <clears throat> I installed the uh, Bionic Pup, just did a search for Puppy, and that was the first one that came up. I recognised that because I think it was on Distro Watch not long ago, I think. Was it? Was it not? Uh, yeah, it was. So um, I installed that, uh, messed up the first install. I, I did my partitions and then installed the full install, 
and uh, it would not start X. So I don't know what that was all about. So I did a frugal install on the second install. And that asks you to save, when, when you install it and you do your first shutdown, it actually asks you to save to a file. And I was a bit confused about all that, but it actually saves it to a file. I think that's what Aris was talking about. Uh, you can, I think if you save more than one file, you can choose which one you want to boot into. I think yeah, that's what that's... I think you I think with the frugal one it's uh yeah. it has the squash file system for all the files and it saves yeah. everything into one file everything for for your settings that you changed. Yeah, so I, I believe that you could probably save another file and you could probably boot into whichever file you want to boot into. I think that's how it would probably work. I haven't tried it, but uh, I am running Puppy Bionic right now, so I just thought I would put it through its paces and see how it went and if it got through today then that's pretty good but for me as a daily driver i don't think so it's a bit dated but uh, it works pretty well anyway but it is a little bit different to the way a lot of other things work so uh, but it's working fine anyway so that's my experience yeah I, like seb said i don't think it's meant for a daily driver it's meant mm. for use cases and and it definitely has mm. those um tony how are you, brother? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Awesome. Did you get to try yes. puppy? I did. Um, it's a bit old-fashioned. It is? It's not modern, but then I expected it not to be. Um, the biggest problem I had with it while I was playing around was it was impossible to get the Wi-Fi to connect. It, it just didn't show me any options at all. So I wouldn't want to use it as a daily driver anyway because I couldn't get connected. But even if I could, I think I'd probably want something more modern and something that's designed as a daily driver. I don't, as you said, I don't think um, Puppy Linux is. But it works, and I can see that it would have its uses. Yeah, I think it? that's how they get it to be so lightweight <laughs> is to keep it keep it as um user friendly but yet uh keep it in that other realm of not having bloated software on it so yeah no it's very minimal what were you going to say eric i was just going to ask if you were using the bionic pup version yes bionic okay i noticed when i did my wireless it asked me if i wanted to use the wlan s0 i think was is my card or I think it said like Windows drivers. I wasn't quite sure what it was asking me to do. Um, I just chose the the one that it, I guess, identified. But I have pretty common hardware, so I'm not surprised that it was it was built in. Um, I just wasn't sure if anyone had tried that other option and what that does. I, I think part of the reason for the the smallness of a puppy, everything when you when you put from USB, everything's in RAM. It doesn't go back to the flash drive. You're in RAM the whole time. It does have a few other tools for network. It does also have uh, one for Broadcom as well, I noticed. I can't remember where that was, but there was two or three different tools. And once you set up your network, it asks you to, if you want to use that one as default, which is what I did. And network starts up every time. But I think there was a couple of other different ones you could use as well. And I think it was in the QuickPet. In the QuickPet software, um, I think there was Broadcom drivers in there. So if you got Broadcom anyway. Yep. All right, uh, Alan, sir, what's your thoughts on Puppy Linux? Hello. So um, I wasn't aware that we were doing Puppy Linux until you started the show. Uh, so while everyone else was talking, I downloaded it, put it on the USB key, put it on my laptop next to me, and I'm now looking at it. So could you come back to me after sure, you've done it? Sure, we'd else? love to come and back to you. Come on, Alan. Same story here. That's uh, that's called a extreme distro hop. <clears throat> that's what that's called. <laughs> oh, Tyler. All right, let's not meme too yeah. hard. Yeah, with getting uh, back from self and going back to work and then doing a lot of moving stuff this weekend, I have not gotten a chance to give it a try. Priorities. Yep, priorities. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, not to worry. These these things are sent to try us. And uh, good luck with a move and good luck with unpacking. Because I know that when I moved back in 1984, it took me about nine months to get rid of all the cardboard boxes. It's just a nightmare. So I don't envy you that task at all. Hey, Tyler, what's your call sign? 
Kilo Echo Zero Whiskey Alpha Victor. Well, congratulations for passing the test. Thank well, I'm you. I'm actually surprised that someone actually knows that. <laughs> nice. All right, Nate, Mr. Positive, come Hi on. There. Puppy yeah. Little. So I, so I started out in a VM just to you know give it a give it a shot there first and kind of like you know look at it and take some snapshots and things, uh, and I liked it. Now, unfortunately, by default it's single click, so that was really aggravating. Uh, but outside of that, the um, the defaults I thought were fine. It you know it looks it looks dated. Uh, it looks like you know, going back to 2004 or so and running you know something at that time. But uh, but I, that's really the only you know complaint I have is it just looks dated. So I decided I'd throw on some 32-bit hardware. And uh, uh, it's a, a Dell Inspiron uh, 5100. It has a 512 meg of RAM. It's got a Pentium 4. It's it's, it's a pretty tight machine, and uh, it uh, actually it runs really well. It's very snappy. I was able to do everything I wanted to do on it. Uh, I didn't do much web browsing, but I didn't care about that. I should probably have tried that. I haven't gotten that far yet. But uh, it, I, I think it does lack kind of an easy button when setting it up. I did kind of mess up the, um, not really mess up, but I didn't really understand like the partitioning, what they wanted. I didn't know what right looked like initially. So after going through it um, on the 32-bit machine, I knew what I messed up on the VM. And also don't do the fin mode. That's a no-no. It's, <laughs> it's highly experimental. Don't do that. Uh, what what is the thin mode and what did you mess up? That's what I did. Uh, yeah, I selected the fin mode, which is like a, I guess it's supposed to be like a, a user instead of admin. You know, Sounds kind of like a... I, want, I want to be safe, you know, let's be safe. Mm -hmm. But it actually connected to Wi-Fi, no problem. And that, that, that uh, laptop does have a Broadcom chipset and everything worked great. Uh, it's was, it was actually, I mean, outside of the partitioning, if you didn't know what you're doing for partitioning, because that wasn't really very, very verbose. Everything else is very descriptive and, uh, you know, told you exactly what it's doing all the time, what it expects of you except for the partitioning. And, uh, and I thought that was great. I, uh, I enjoyed it. I'm actually going to keep playing with it. I'm going to see how, uh, how far I can push this uh, crusty old 32-bit machine. And, uh, and if it blows up, hey, that's cool too. Nice. It only blows up after 1910. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, Prophetech well, has turned up late, yeah. so I'm just going to keep him waiting in the waiting room for a minute just to, just to wind him up. No, no. <laughs> Let's let's bring him in before he has a little a little hissy fit there. So, um, Mr. VM himself, Thomas, did you get to try Puppy? Yes, I did, and I actually did not try it in a VM this time. I tried it on actual hardware for once. Wow! Ah. Right? You know, just um, so we can take the EFI counting it. You know, along with all the other operating systems that it has for a Grub menu, because then it just adds on and on and on. The more the more operating systems you put on there. So. Um, when I tried Puppy, I did Bionic and booted up perfectly fine, um, to be expected, of course. Um, the only real issue I actually had with it was I was trying to install a dev file manually. And typically when I do that, I do sudo apt install dot slash and give the file name because it's easier than doing dpackage dash i and then fixing stuff. Um, but apt is not installed on Bionic Puppy. But dpackage is. Yeah, and that's pretty lame. There may be a reason they did it. I don't know. I'm not asking why. I'm just thinking, if you're going to make a distro that has dpackage but not apt that's fine but you should probably add a little bitty script in there named apt so that when somebody runs the apt command expecting apt they get a little printout saying hey apt isn't installed this is what the actual command line package manager is use this instead that way you don't have to deal with dpackage directly because dpackage is a pain to deal with directly. Um, otherwise, I've tried Puppy before, and I think this version of Puppy looks a lot better than the version I tried before. I don't remember what version I tried. Um, but yeah, because of that one issue, I was like, next. And, so it's, not, um, 
It's not going to replace Draugr OS then. <laughs> <laughs> no. Are, are you um, going to be rebasing Draugr off of Puppy? No, not in a million years. <laughs> but doesn't hey, Puppy hey, have Thomas. a low latency kernel? It does, I think. <laughs> hey, hey, Thomas, for, yeah. for a, a dev a package, you can just click on it and it installs. I did not know this. Is this through GW or something? You just click on the package itself, on the file, and then the Puppy uh, Package Manager uh, pops up and then it tries to install it. Okay. So no VM to blame it on this time. <laughs> no, certainly not. It's mostly <laughs> my ignorance. There's the puppy man. Yeah. What up, what up y'all? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get to you in a minute, we promise. We tried saying puppy <laughs> three times to see if you'd appear, and Adam showed up instead. Puppy, puppy, <laughs> puppy. <laughs> we just oh, was that much that? For that? You know, I, I, the thing is, if you want to install a package, you'd be better off just like going online and getting it, and then you know, just run the dpackage command. Otherwise, I think it's kind of good for computers that like are very small and old, like the ones that run Windows ninety five. Like this, that would be perfect for this because it kind of looks really dated. Mm -hmm. All right, Dan, did you get to try Puppy? I did. I didn't do a lot of time with it, but I did. Uh, I did fire it up in a VM. I did the Slackware version, the Slacko Puppy, and uh, that was interesting. Um, everybody else has said it's dated, but it's exceptionally dated in the Slackware version. Um, it's it's running uh, Firefox uh, 38 ESR, which is ancient, I think, pretty old. Um, it, it's not quite as old as uh, installing a Fedora Core 1, you know, maybe or maybe not has happened recently. <laughs> but uh, it was it was a good uh, trip down the memory lane. All right, Eric, sir, uh, with all the website and changes that you've been doing, so if people don't know, but Eric's been doing a ton of work. I mean, we talked about it earlier in the show, but he's been doing a ton of work on the back end of the Biddle site to, you know, make it usable and make it look nice and actually have content on it. And he's been doing an awesome job. So uh, in all that, did you get a chance to try Puppy? I actually did. Yeah. And so I didn't use it extensively, but I appreciate it for what it is. And I really didn't understand what it was. So I'm glad that I got to do the challenge to see how I could use it personally. So I, there are times where I have to deal with older computers that either won't boot or just are having issues, hardware issues, and you don't know if it's the operating system. And I can see this being my go-to for those situations to, to run those tests, to see if the hardware is running, to get data off of a disk, that type of stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, from that perspective, the USB with persistence, I mean, that's a great toolkit. I think Nate had said, or maybe, no, uh, Ryan had said that he has, a, you know, he carries one around with him. And I, and I could see myself doing that as well. It's funny because usually I react really negatively to the older UIs, you know, the older desktop environments. And for whatever reason, it's kind of endearing. Like, I don't love the wallpaper on Bionic Pup. I think it's a little creepy, <laughs> personally. Yeah, Bionic well, that's dog. something you know puppy starting. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, the barking, yeah, I wasn't expecting that either. I actually laughed out loud when you know, it was. It's actually barked. kind of cute. <laughs> it is, it is, but I, I wasn't was like, you know, It's kind of like one of those times where just clowns, like, you know, on that creepy pasta website, but it's actually kind of cute. It and is. And I think that's kind of a nice addition to the whole entire thing itself. It welcomes you in with a nice smile. Except for those who hate dogs. Well, even even people who don't like dogs like puppies usually. So I mean, come on. Oh well, yeah. So yeah, and and so the UI and the the tools that are included. I mean, it, for being as small as it is, it's pretty comprehensive in terms of the tool set that's there. And and I think as a technician, someone who's looking at computers, you've got pretty much just about everything you need to be able to do that. And so, I don't know if people intend. To run it on a daily basis, I mean, maybe if you just had older equipment and that's what you had access to, it would be a great daily driver. But going through the install, yeah, it was a little confusing, a little strange. Um, you know, no UE, yeah, UEFI support, at least that I could see. It, I mean, it says that it doesn't support it very clearly um, unless I was doing something wrong. Um, but yeah. I mean, otherwise, it's it's a collection of things that I probably would have never tried, 
and had never thought to look at. And I'm now glad that I have. And actually, the next time that I need to buy a non-booting PC, that'll probably be my go-to. Because usually I'll boot up something heavier, like a full-blown Ubuntu or something like that, where maybe the, it doesn't have a comprehensive tool set. It's got a heavier UI. It takes longer to boot, um, that kind of thing. So I could see this being much more uh, suited to that type of work. Right. <laughs> John, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? It was... John, who uh, walked into self and started taking all, he's got this camera, like, I don't know, 85 pounds. It's like this big. I may be exaggerating a little bit, but um, it was awesome to meet you, man. Yeah, it was great to meet you guys. It's kind of fun to put faces to, well, faces that you see on Zoom all the time. Yep. That was good fun. Yep. So speaking of self, I didn't have time to play with Puppy. Matter of fact, I think I just found out about Puppy today. I've been busy building this stack of free NAS and uh, Ubuntu development server and a unified controller. So I have played with it in the past on an old ThinkPad uh, X61, I think. You know, it was a good thing to play with. I prefer Peppermint over it, but uh, yeah. So I didn't get a chance to play with it this time. Right. Well, Dave, um, Ryan said that he uses it and it's ridiculously light and runs fantastic using the persistence. Did you get a chance to try it and verify that? Uh, the persistence, no, but I did get a chance to try it. Uh, I threw it into a VM and I loved running it as it came up. It was very intuitive. Uh, I loved the tools that it came up and showed and walked you step by step through the processes of the different things. Uh, it gave you the option to set up the video right away, uh, all the different hardware options where I ran into a problem that I didn't have time to learn properly was trying to install it. It would install fine uh, right up until it got to the point where install Grub for DOS. And I was like, okay, but it's a GPT uh, partition table and it's a UEFI puppy ISO. So that really didn't make sense. So I, I tried it uh, installing Grub for DOS and it wouldn't boot. And I in, tried installing it without Grub for DOS and it wouldn't boot. So I could run it live fine and I really enjoyed it, but I, I couldn't figure out how to get it to actually boot once it was on the hardware. So, um, but I know that is a failing of mine, not of puppies. I, that I didn't have the time to sort through and figure it out or to ask questions in the proper forum. Um, but what I saw of it, uh, I really liked the way it stepped you through the process, um, explaining what was needed, what it's doing, where it's going. And I thought that was very good, very helpful. And, uh, like Eric, it will probably one, be one of my go-to live USB sticks for when I am troubleshooting other people's pro, uh, computers from now on. Nice. That's 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 the next question that I was going to ask you. Is it going to become part of your tool chain? So yeah, you answered that one. Excellent. Yes, it it will be going into the stack of USBs <laughs> that I keep and and wander around with. Marvelous, Bill. Did you get a chance to uh, try it, my friend? I think he said to skip him. Sad. Oh, did it? All right, my bad. I must have missed that then. Okay, Joshua, welcome. I don't think we've uh, had you in the chat before, so welcome to Biddle. Did you get to try Puppy Thank Linux? Thank you. Okay, so I've heard about Puppy Linux before. Um, I just tried it out. I couldn't figure out how to install it, but here are my impressions. There's pros and cons to this. The pro thing is... If you have an old computer, this is your perfect thing. Like as um, I think it was Dave who said um, that was good for troubleshooting. I can really agree. The only issue is there can be bugs, and uh, you know it doesn't come with the uh, the package manager apt. And I think that otherwise, 
it's kind of cool. I think that, you know, we should still praise it because taking, making an operating system any kind, it takes time. I would say that we should still give this a round of applause. I just think that this is really kind of a little underrated, but I think that it can, that there's going to be a lot of times where every, everybody's going to need this type of operating system. But if we just forget about it, it's not going to be there. And then, you know, because that day's going to come someday for all of us. So uh, we should all embrace this. Cool. Nice. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Rocco, should we jump back to Alan? Because he looks like he's finished with fiddling. Do it. <laughs> uh, I have finished fiddling. Um, so I, I've only used the live environment because I've been limited time. Um, and I love this. I think, um, was it? Uh, Tony who said uh, this is endearing uh, I can't remember who it was said uh, this is an endearing user interface um, yes it, you could consider it dated uh, or you could consider it um, not modern or whatever vintage. other adjectives uh, sorry vintage vintage yes <laughs> but I really like it. Um, it it found my network card in my laptop I'm, I'm running it on um, an X61S, which is a Core 2 Duo, um, and I'm running it out of RAM, and it's pretty performant. Um, applications are loading pretty much instantly, and I'm I'm impressed with the array of applications that it has installed. You know, all the Office stuff that I need. It's got loads of utilities, uh, all the tools I would need. So I think this is exactly the kind of thing that I would put on a key ring on my keys. I already have one, but it's a really big fat install of Ubuntu with loads and loads of stuff on it. And I think this might be better just because it's runs from RAM and I don't have to like um, update it at all. I can just run it straight out of RAM as it is. I think it's lovely. I think it's great. And this is going to feature on my keyring very soon. So yeah, I'm glad I tried it out. And I, oh, by the way, I, um, I can't remember who someone said that they couldn't find an EFI, EFI version. There is a UFI version, but it's not the Slack version. It's the one that's based on Bionic. So that one's got UFI if you need that. Hmm. But yeah, little boot overall, from it. Sorry, Pope. Yeah. I don't know. Should do. I, I haven't tried it. Like I only no, learned of it from looking at the index files on the web server just now. Well, that was <laughs> no. I, that's actually the one I had that booted fine into the live environment, and it it ran fine. It just the trying to get it installed on hardware between the UFI version. And um, wanting Grub for DOS, looking for an MBR. Oh, wow. um, well, doesn't it give tape. you doesn't it give you a warning on the UEFI version that when you go to install it that it's not supposed to it doesn't really work with UEFI installation if it yes. if you're trying to UEFI. Uh, okay. Yeah, it does, and that's that's yeah, fine because usually I, I mean I'd be running this on an older system anyway, or you're just booting it live and it, it's going to boot. Either way, it'll boot on UEFI hardware. It just won't install. So no. Okay, so like the EULA, I clicked through without actually reading. <laughs> Read. <laughs> and might I say that, Mr. Pope, that was a fantastic ten-minute uh, review. I mean, you just—you're going to be our speed reviewer. From now on. <laughs> that's that's your job from now on. Well, you can't test the dishes beforehand. You have to test them <laughs> while we while we talk about them and then talk about it. So I'll join late, so I'm at the bottom of the stack <laughs> down at the end. <laughs> I'll be the last one you come to, and I'll be, like, furiously testing <laughs> over here. Um, but every distro has to work on my ThinkPad X61S because that's my test machine, which is okay. right here. It's okay. Nice. Adam, good to see you again. Great meeting you at um, Self, and as it was, John and everybody else who's in the chat that was there. So... Puppy Linux, what do you think? Um, I'm kind of more of a cat person, so <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, use it um, at all, like anywhere near it. I'm not gonna do it. No, I'm just. <laughs> um, I've used Puppy in the past, and it's okay. It just, it seems like it serves its purpose, but I don't know. I don't. It's not useful to me. So, Adam, I'm so disappointed in you. What? Only for the reason that you didn't do what you said you were going to do. Oh, yeah. Well, 
I forgot about it until you just now said that. Oh. <laughs> it's fine. So the plan was to go on about a whole different distro without mentioning that it wasn't Puppy. <laughs> and then, like, review another distro in place of Puppy. But, yeah, uh, it didn't work out. No. So. What well, would have been interesting to see whether or not um, Powered by Puppy and Prophetic spotted it. Yeah. <laughs> well, on. if I would have said, you know, I think the Puppy. DNF package manager is good, then they probably would have caught it. <laughs> <laughs> Big pod. What's up, brother? Uh, nothing. Did you get to try Puppy this week, dude? Didn't get to try it. Okay. Dig it. <laughs> All right. Um, Eric, my man. Oh, I was just about to let the dogs out, the puppies to, out to find you, and you showed up. So there you go. Woof, 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 woof. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I felt like the, it was appropriate to wear tonight. Yep. So, in, in my defense, according to my calendar, I'm still here 19 minutes early because what I didn't take into account when I put this on my calendar on the East Coast was that I'm actually in central time. So when I set up the invite, I didn't. Sounds like the... poor planning to me, dude. I know, I know. <laughs> that, that sounds like a Michael Tunnell excuse. <laughs> Are you all uh, moved in and settled? Um, if you don't look at the kitchen, yes. Okay, good. Then we won't look at the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but I got the important stuff up. The laptop's up. The screens are up. The microphone's up. And, that's, that's and you're matters, here. Right? And that's all that matters. Nice. Exactly. So, and I did get to try puppy. Tell us um, about it. So, I, I thought it was a, an an interesting approach to the the software manager. Um, normally, I just go to the command line because that's where I'm comfortable. But uh, it it was kind of nice going through, uh, seeing that it already had some of the basics installed, and then you had the ability to install some of the other basics, uh, like uh, went in and installed Firefox, and, and then like a couple of other folks, I tried going to the to the console. And tried app, tried yum, tried a few others. It's like, okay, this this doesn't have any of the ones I'm familiar with. So I'm, I'm sure Popey's never heard this joke, but I, I'm going to use it anyway. I was just like, oh, snap. I wonder if there's snaps. <laughs> and sure enough, it, it did have snaps and flat packs. So I, I'm really, really bad at these because I'm, I'm so ingrained in my workflows. If it's not If it's not Gnome on Fedora or Gnome on Arch, by the way, I run Arch. By the way. <laughs> Um, then, you know, I, it, it's hard for me to, to switch over. I've, I've been kind of in the same space for my entire career and, and my entire time as a, as a Linux systems administrator, but, uh, I could definitely see, um, how this could be useful. If, if I was going to different, different data centers, you know, back when I first started, it was going to different, going between the main data center and the colo and having to drag around one of those carts and it would just be nice to have something like this on a usb that it could throw into a into a uh, into one of the carts reboot the system and have all of my tools laid out exactly the way i want this would be perfect for that but nowadays uh, nowadays uh, my my work a lot like my work ethic is, is just all exists in the cloud so right <laughs> I, I could do work from from my from my android device if if i had to Take it. So I I liked it. It was it was a nice concept, and and I I worry just how much uh, a distro like Puppy is going to be around, just because our a lot of the lower end hardware, you know, the the older systems we keep trying to target aren't in existence anymore. Especially like for me, I I got a, a Lenovo T four T four thirty for like one hundred and eighty bucks off of eBay, and it it works great as a as a test machine. Right. Well, I don't think Puppy needs to have older equipment around to continue to exist because it does have that niche use case of being able to boot from the USB. And I think that is what it's designed for, in my opinion. So I don't think it needs older hardware to be around to exist. I think it'll exist on its on its own. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, that's great. Great point. Um, Bill, are you back, dude? Yeah, I'm back. I was actually listening the whole time. It's just oh, you were just messing crazy, with so. us, right? Yeah, I'm just messing with you. So obviously, <laughs> this was an uneventful week in the world of Linux. Obviously, somebody here will probably talk about that in a little bit. But um, when we did Discord after the show last week, I threw Puppy on just 
because I wanted to see what Prophetic just rambled on about continuously in the channel. And it obviously, it's a very interesting setup. And it reminds me of Slack's Linux. And Slack's is a really tiny USB type distro. And the thing that gets me is like the fact that since there's no system D running on the Ubuntu based version, you can't do snaps or flat packs. And that kind of, yeah, it has a lot of utilities up front, but if I really want something on my USB to manage a system, if I need to throw something on real quick, having an ability to throw a snap application or just pretty much run any kind of utility, it kind of defeats the purpose. I mean, it's cool. It's really neat. The, the install on the real hardware is actually kind of fun because it tells you, oh, open up uh, Gparted, do this, do that. I mean, it's really cool. And it has Pale Moon, and you never see Pale Moon anywhere. Um, so I could see where it could be a nice utility distro. Obviously, you'd be a little bit crazy to run this as your daily driver. I mean, somebody probably does. Prophetic. <clears throat> <laughs> no, I think that's <laughs> MX, which he can't update the kernel for because all of their bots are currently attacking distro watch. So, um, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's really neat. So, and I could really see that if you wanted a utility distro that you didn't want to install something to, or you wanted to use it for online banking, it's cool. Um, I would probably choose Slacks over that for that kind of use case, but it's really neat. And I understand, I think Eris too talks about it, but you know, I really was like, what kind of craziness is it? And I had never run it before. It's, it's actually a really neat idea. And if I, I should have probably run the Slackware version just for the heck of it, but I was, I mean, it's easy to run the Ubuntu based version of it. So that's what I got. Cool. Uh, Really quick, someone correct me if I'm wrong. I think Xenio Pup is actually built off Snaps or App Images One. I can't remember which off the top of my head. No, neither of them are. I'm wrong then. Okay. All right, Paul. Hi, and did you try Puppy? Uh, yeah, I like Puppy. I've always liked Puppy, but I was on the site, and if you click on the active say all then it brings up some more in here and I tried this one called Mac Pup and so far I actually love it it's it's not in development anymore but yeah it's a really nice distro I don't know why they went out of business or whatever but yeah I've always liked Puppy cool nice thank you very much indeed Okay, JJ. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I, I nearly missed Prophetic there. Yeah, what almost. Fun. Come on in, big fella. Tell I was us about, all about I it. I was about to start barking at y'all. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're, we're going to do a, a Michael Tunnell on you. Yeah, you got five minutes. Go. <laughs> um, well, first, I want to say I'm sorry because this officially ends Biddle on the Distro Challenge uh, because it's obviously going to be the uh, distro for everyone going forward. After this, there is no other distro to choose anymore. Obviously. It is the answer. No, so just real quick, um, the reason why I, I was so into Puppy was because of nostalgic reasons. It was only the reason why. I, the first time I actually used it, it was on an old machine and it brought life to it and it blew my mind. So it was like, not just my start with Linux, but my start of like reviving old machines. And uh, I did some pretty fun things with Puppy. So it became a meme on Biddle. So I, I have to confess, I don't use Puppy day to day, um, but it is on my keychain. Um, and it's a, a fun way to test machines and, and check things out. But I would say that uh, the fact that Bionic Puppy makes it that much easier to use and maintain. And I'm just so excited that still going strong and all the variants there aren't there there's a pup for everybody <laughs> so i say that to say i agree with the word uh like the desktop environment is is charming it's endearing all those words uh yes it is a little dated but that's kind of part of the appeal for me at least and um yeah i think it's a, a really fun distro really representative of like the linux experience like there's really something out there for everybody <laughs> 
Well, I will definitely say that we review these, and I know we've done a lot of a string of the Ubuntu-based distros, but really anymore, I feel like I fire up a distro and it's really what tweaks have they made to the desktop environment. Maybe there's a couple custom tools that they've included. But when you fire this up, like it is its own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I totally. Yeah. So, yeah, so I enjoy it. And um, Mac Pup was also one that uh, was uh, a, a sweet spot for me, too. Um, even though it was like horrendous enlightenment and implementation, um, it was, again, it was so crazy out there. It was nice. Uh, I, I used to get in trouble with, um, with uh, puppy when I almost, I would evade trouble, but I would actually make puppy look like XP because they had like skins and different layers. And I would go to my uh, computer labs in my college and they usually have a time limit or some type of limit on what you can browse. And, uh, I would just stick my thumb drive. They didn't have any bios password or anything like that. And uh, I was just rock and roll. And then there was one lab that was right next to the IT office where after 10 minutes of running it, it would get blocked. And then I would say, oh, that's my cue to go. And then as I was walking <laughs> out, there was an IT person walking in, looking at everyone's screens. And I'm just kind of like, oh, it took me a while to realize that they were probably looking for me. Um, but yeah, so that's why Puppy's a special place in my heart. But very fun distro. And if you still haven't tried it, you still have, what, another hour or so to give it a spin? <laughs> That story reminds me of, um, so at my college, we, the desktops were the same way. They didn't have a BIOS password. And before I had my own laptop, I installed Ubuntu on an external hard drive and was booting from that. And somehow someone else, it actually wasn't me for once, um, someone almost formatted a hard drive wrong on one of their computers and they noticed it was Linux. And me and an, a friend almost got kicked out because they discovered that we were booting from USB with external hard drives like that. Uh, so. Once I accidentally mounted um, a partition of unallocated space into my home Ubuntu directory, and when I realized that I literally just made my home directory nothing, crap. Because, you know, you just can't access it, so you have to unmount it as soon as possible. I remember 10 years ago, I had a teacher that actually had Ubuntu on, like, two of the computers through... Uh, anyone remembers Wooby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't. You're, yeah, you're about to get schooled right now. It's basically <laughs> a way to install Ubuntu to a virtual partition that and it would add an entry to the Windows bootloader to boot from that virtual disk that was created by the Wooby installer. I, th okay. I think that's how it works. Mm -hmm. It's been a while. But yeah, it was like a container inside inside windows but it wasn't it, it allowed you to dual boot but without because at the time it was really scary to repartition your disk and right. so ruby enabled you to install ubuntu inside a file inside your windows partition and then you could reboot into it um and it was kind of like a a way to get started with mm. with ubuntu um, and what was good about it is you could then go back into windows uninstall it and then not get left with no bootloader, no grub menu, and how do I get my Windows bootloader back on? So, yeah, what was that? <laughs> Wooby? Is that what you guys were talking about? Yeah, yeah, Wooby. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah I... that's what I started on as well. I actually thought it was like a virtual machine variant. So when I installed Wooby, like it would be like I'll fire up a virtual machine and Ubuntu would be there, and I literally dual install the machine at my job at, at a <laughs> university where I worked Oops. at. That's how green I was. I was so dangerous with it. So it was so easy. It was actually dangerous for me. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, okay, I guess we're dual booting. And like every day I came into work thinking I was going to have someone from IT, like be just sitting in my office waiting for me to come in. They never came. So it wasn't like three months later, did they actually run something and they got me running on something else. And um, it was just, it was, yeah. A conversation. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to Puppy. JJ, did you have a chance to try Puppy this week? JJ, are you with us? No, nope, we'll skip you then. Um, hi, Steve. Welcome to Biddle. Did you get to try Puppy? And we can't hear a word you're saying. And don't say he's running something on Puppy right now. No, Zoom probably is not picking up his mic. But I love the sign. I, I love the I love the logo in the back somehow. 
just PS I ran puppy it's on just a so cool. Yeah. Steve Steve's been kicking up the production value recently. Ah, <laughs> 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 there we go. How's that? That's there good. We go. All right. I got I select the right thing. So I dramatically said, Puppy, I thought you meant peppermint. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just ran it a little bit. I, I did back in the day when I, you know, the big five years ago when I started with Linux, I, I did try Puppy on a netbook. Um, and I was kind of amazed that it ran in RAM and very little, very little size. Um, you know, is it something that would be a daily driver for me? Definitely not, but it's probably definitely something that would really bring old hardware to life. Like if you wanted to use it, like what I do with my netbook, um, I have it as a slideshow right now. It's running peppermint, but if it was, you know, any lower in Ram or something like that, I can see puppy coming in and helping do the job. All right, uh, JJ, did you get back yet, dude? All right, we're going to skip JJ. And um, hey, that's our take on Puppy Linux. Uh, overall, I think none of us here would mm -hmm. run it as a, as a daily driver, but that's not its use case. Um, I think it has a perfect use case for certain applications. So there you go. Okay, Can I just add one? Yeah, Joe is there? Yeah. Where are you at, Joe? Oh. There you the are. Screen. You're off the screen. Hey, Joe, yeah. how you doing? There you are. I've been, wa I've been watching you guys, but I've, <laughs> I've had that week from you know what again. But anyway, I got in a VM that's as far as I got. And I, I was listening to mention earlier, I think it was Tony about the Wi-Fi, and it's, it's kind of almost like it felt like it was hidden, what little bit I played with it. I remember after installing it, it, it almost... This is going to be a long shot, but it almost kind of reminds you of little, little tinges of arch where you got to find things to put in that you want to put in there. But uh, uh, prophetic, just for you, a real mature Ryan Dos Geek response to that comment about it being the only distro. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm sorry. I'm trying to be human. Wow. Well, you have no, he's, he knows I'm joking a little bit. It's just I thought, man, you're going to make a statement. Like a I think I got sprayed from here. No, it, I, it, you know, I will say for being in a VM, I mean, it, it's like Rocco said, click, boom, it's open, click, boom. And so everything ran real good. So in fairness, I didn't have a lot of time to try it. But I remember when I did put it on machines years ago, even when they were still considered old then, I want to say I think it was 7.0 Slackware or whatever I put on. I can't remember which one it was. Um, there was one machine I had that, no hard drive and I couldn't find a hard drive. Right. So I ran it in Ram and it ran beautifully. I love that. Yeah. The downside to it is just, you know, not being able to save uh, data or whatever within a case like that. But, you know, again, like you guys were saying, you put in a USB drive, it would be great for probably just like you said, emergency service, that kind of things. I don't think it'd be a daily driver for me. Um, pardon this phrase, but it almost seems kiddish to me the way it's the icons. And, you know, I mean, I don't know. It just seems, I don't know if that's a good phrase. It doesn't seem like most polished distros, I guess. The icon set I did notice is a lot nicer than what I remember them to be. Um, I do like the fact that you could change the icon layouts. I, again, I didn't spend a lot of time, but in the short time I did, I discovered all of this. I never knew that you could get rid of all those icons off of there and pick you know, how you want it. If you don't like it, you just select the one and boom, it's gone. So they have to manually delete them all. So. Um, it's not a distro that I would run every day, but didn't you just say yourself prophetic that you don't run it daily? No, no, I'm a, I'm a IMX guy. And, uh, I made that confession earlier. Yeah. It was, it became a meme and also a, a, a mission in life to get Biddle to try puppy. Okay. Cause I was wondering why it was puppy, puppy, puppy. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, and then he goes, I already says, but I don't run it every day. I go, Oh boy. <laughs> no, no, no I, I actually did run it back in the day when I only had, I didn't have like the money to, you know, I did actually run it as a daily at one point. Um, and I got to know the system pretty well from that. But after that, you know, I moved on to, to, to other distros, but yeah, at one point I did. But is, is it me or is did anybody else feel like you had to kind of, it, the initial installer wasn't horrible, but it still felt like you had to kind of search for things. The, net, the network, for one thing, it doesn't just automatically find it and do it. You know, you had to go in there and select the non-Windows choice to get that going. Yeah. Uh, and once it did it, it found it 
like that, you know, now, yeah, the, the hardware I'm running is newer too. So I don't know if it would have been the same thing if it was on an older system. Um, I do know that it had the uh, UEFI option there too, which I didn't, I didn't go with obviously. And then the VM, it's kind of a moot point anyway, unless you're doing a pass through on it. So, but uh, anyway, I mean, that's about as far as I can give you on it. So. Can I say just one more quick thing about Puppy before we close out? Um, one, it was I was I, looking back at it. It was great with like its early versions of what it would what we call today as a welcome screen. Um, the SFS uh, file package uh, uh, to, to install apps with, like Squash. I forgot the exact term uh, they have uh, for it. Um, was actually like an early containerized version, what we think of like you know, snaps or something like that. Like it was early iterations of that idea. So it was ahead of the time there. Um, and yeah, those two things, uh, plus the persistence, how, may, how easy they made persistence. I think there's um, something to say that it should have a special place in Linux history for distros. Do you think, do you think it would be better served more as a repair tool? Oh yeah, a, a totally. Distro? Yeah. Totally. Utility, if anything, yeah. All right, so there's Puppy Linux. We need to pick a distro for next week. I have a couple of housekeeping okay, so things real quick. We're a bunch of talk about it. Um, I was just kind of looking through DistroWatch, but um, people um, were thinking oh, lots of different opinions. K-War, whatever that is. I was thinking Regolith, Big Pot, um, Vanilla Arch. Alpine. Um, the issue is, I think that for one of them that he mentioned, the um, the ISO was pretty big. People are also talking about Porteus, or I think that's how you say it. Um, but people are really having a great idea with that. Well, Eric, well, well, Eric, I, Eric, what did you want to say? Sorry, I put it in the YouTube chat and the uh, the Zoom chat as well. So I, today I took a little bit of time and got the list from Peter and Zeb and stuck it on the website. So if you go to the, I, I put the links in, I'll stick them in one more time just since I'm saying it. Um, that list shows everything that's been done and Arch is not on that list. So that's definitely one <laughs> never done. Regolith is interesting because it's a tile, it's i3, it's a tiling window manager. Probably not for everyone, so. Probably not for everybody, but it's one of those things, Puppy's not for everyone, but exactly. it's something dry. Mm -hmm. You know, if we keep doing the same things over and over, it kind of feels a little stale, frankly. Just yeah. I, I, I was going to say, I, I, I get where you're coming from, Eric. So there was a few suggestions. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. I was just going to say, the question is how many people have, now you can say whether or not time is a thing, but how many people have time? Because I already know where this conversation is going. Um, how many people have time for the vanilla arch? Well, I don't think we need to do vanilla. I think you can come really close if you go Arch Labs and use that so, AI installer. If you go I can all All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't all talk at once or nobody's going to hear. Okay, so. If you install Arch Linux there, you get base install. And it's just a GUI Climaris installer, first of all. So you can use that. It's and even even by installing through a uh, through the terminal by hand, it isn't that hard. You, yes, if you do it in a VM, you you can't mess up anything. Thomas, go on a minute. I guess you can go. So, um, I was gonna also suggest that we do Drogger OS because I did have a release recently, and you guys are basically the most vocal form of feedback that I get and having that feedback is extremely helpful. We did it recently though, didn't we? We did do that, it recently. Yes. Yeah. That was a different version. Um, Puppy just came out with something else too. No, I appreciate <laughs> no, you wanting the feedback. So wait, I appreciate so that. But I think that uh, we do need to get through a couple more uh, that we have never tried. Um, you know, like I was, I was looking yeah. and Actually, Ryan suggested the same thing that I was looking at was Open Mandriva, which would be an option. They just came out with a release. Uh, a couple of people said PC Linux OS that came out with a release and others. Uh, I think it was um, Vanilla Arch and Ron had suggested something, and I forget what it was, something about Cinnamon. Um, I that was forget. like the Cinearch or whatever kind of distro. Yeah. I, th I threw about, in yeah. uh, Artix as well. Yeah. Will we ever consider going to BSD land? 
I was thinking no. the exact no. Damn. No, That's really. dangerous, sir. That is very dangerous. Have you ever even tried BSD? Yes, for me. yes I have. BSD. Okay, okay. Linux. Okay. You know. okay. my, my view on BSD is that it's basically going back to the 80s. Uh, uh, after after trying Puppy, that that's a compliment. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that good. It's not that good. Uh, and it, so, <laughs> red hat. We can do that if you if you get the licenses for all of us. <laughs> no, 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 you, you can, can apply for a developer's license. Yeah, everybody can get a red hat. I've been trying to free. get people to do red hat, but by the way, you can get a free red hat developer license if you want to just give them an email address. By the way, we should try Arch. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I have for one one version of Arch myself. How about, Does anybody have any other suggestions besides the ones that were brought up? I have one. Um, it, it just may sound radical, but I guess that's in the camp I'm in. But how about Android X86? Yeah, no. I do not suggest that because I have actually tried that and there is no way to install anything. <laughs> Out of the box. Maybe it it's possible that place. maybe if we like take it, maybe we can fork out the desktop. So then people who love it. Okay, wait. Um, I'm gonna stop right now because currently we're gonna watch Nate cringe uh writing down on his notepad, Open Mandrivel or PC Linux OS. Spotlight is now on him. <laughs> I, I would not, not suggest Android x 86 64. I, I have more but, paper. Um, I'd be eating for <laughs> clubs. <laughs> In the drive, so, so Rocco, Rocco, we have tried PC Linux OS, but that was Ali's version. So no, that was Trinity that we tried. Yeah, that was Trinity we tried. So, what is the base of the, uh, the, the standard KDE? Is it? And so is uh, Open Mandriva as well. KDE. Right. Okay. So Rocco, we did Arco not that long ago, but I don't think we actually did Arch Labs. Is that the same thing, kind of? No. I'm not First, no, not, the no, same thing. The, not the same thing. Yeah, no. what happened was Eric used to be working for with the guys at Arch Labs. They wanted to go too minimal. Eric wanted to go everything and you know in the kitchen sink, um, and we know that he's now done that along with his. I think he's just popped the one thousandth video up on YouTube or something silly. So yeah, they, although they're Arch based, they're totally different distributions now. So that we didn't really do Arch Labs, though, have we? No. Well, here's the thing. It's okay to do Arch Labs. It's okay to do um, some of these other ones. But I do think at some point, one of these weeks, we do need to try a vanilla Arch install. Not everybody's going to do it, and that's okay. But not everybody does it every week. Exactly. There were many people yeah. here that didn't try Puppy, and that's okay. You don't have to do it if you don't want to do it. But I think at yeah, some point, long. we should do a vanilla Arch. Um I don't think it should be this week. <laughs> I think that there's other ones to pick, but at some point, I think we should. And I think the the vanilla arch can be uh, allowed in a VM because you don't need to like yeah. mess with your system. Yeah, that, that should be like yeah. a given. Yeah, Ab absolutely. And, yeah. and there's we there's some of us in here that'll that'll help. Yeah, um, others that that want to learn and and haven't done it. So. Right. If, if I could beg for the vanilla arch to be put off because I'm not sure I'll be able to be here next week and I really do want to be here for the arch. Yeah, we should I, schedule I said that it one. probably won't be this week, Dave. Mm -hmm. So That's a good yeah. idea, Prophetic. We should schedule that one. We should just say, yeah. like, yeah, it, yeah. this is yeah. when we're going to do it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, so summer is the perfect time. But the thing is, when? Because it's first when week of August. With their families, and that really can put the whole entire idea into jeopardy. Now, look, it's not. No, no look. Here's the thing: we're outside. we're overthinking oh, stop, this. Time out. We're overthinking this. This is not like we have to plan this out, or we got to say a specific week. Look, we try it one week, and if you're able to try it, you try it, and if you're not, you just yeah. skip it. It's no big deal. There's no planning involved. There's no nothing needed. We're overthinking it. Just it's just like have fun. Okay, from next Tuesday at eight sixty. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's like <laughs> just we'll just try it at some point. We will do a vanilla arch. It's not going to be this week. Yeah. So I have proposed on, on Telegram. I don't know if you saw my post that every two months we would do like a hard install, so that it wouldn't be like every week. Would, and then we can do one off. Like the vanilla arch will be one off. And let's say like Void will be one off and Slackware maybe, but it, it will space it out so it's not every week. It'll be like every every other every other month. Well, this is my suggestion. We already did Trinity OS. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do PC Linux OS, but we haven't done anything like Open Mandriva. 
Mm -hmm. So that why don't we that. pick Open Mandriva and then maybe next week or the week after we can do a PC Linux or S or something we haven't done else. Or we can do our, or yeah. we can do the Arch install or whatever. It doesn't matter. Is everybody yeah, okay with that? Yeah, <laughs> Open Mandriva is good because yeah. we're I want to mind he's probably dancing in his heart. L listen, but, uh, listen, no. we can't, Joshua. I appreciate you talking, but we can't talk over people, okay? Because people are all trying to talk at once and nobody can hear anything. So. It's great that you're here, and I want you here, but you have to be able to let other people talk. Okay, nobody talk at once. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in all serious, that sounds good to me too. Yeah. yeah. And um, Eric, I know it's going to be really, really quick, but I th I'm pretty sure that you've put links to the other distros up there. How quick could you get the Open Mandriva one, or can we find it and just pop it in chat? I can, I have it here. I can pop it in. Oh, okay. excellent. Great stuff. Can always depend on Rocco. He's a, he's a quick one. <laughs> All right. Open Mandriva. That's awesome. I haven't tried a Mandrake Mandriva variant for oh, 10 years. What's this based on? What's this based on? Sorry. Started my Linux they, they just moved Mandrake. it to um, DNF. So they okay. switched from RPN uh, to DNS. RPN. Yeah, okay. I'm kind of curious as how this differs from uh, the other Mandriva fork that was uh, Magia. Mm. Yeah. I think you just said it. It's based on DNF instead of URPMI. Yep. It, I think. it uh, switched I'm guessing. in this version, I believe, that they were switching from RPM to DNF. Mm -hmm. So there Hopefully you go. Hopefully it's nothing like Magia. Magia was a big fail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Whoa. So, so, before we, before we go any further. Questions. Sorry, Alan, go ahead. Is my audio broken? It is. There you oh, go. okay. I'm just being rude. Uh, DistroTube asking the important questions. Is it double click or single click? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to say that Puppy was single click. One plus for Puppy. What about Open Mandriva? I don't uh, know. I was, I'll I was, let I was, you know next week. I was going to say, Rocco, that's going to be the defining factor for Open Mandriva before you, isn't it? By default, which one is it? Alan, you're not allowed to try it beforehand. You'll have to connect next week and install it then. <laughs> if it's not single click, I'll so make it. Back. Wait, 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 is next back. week the European or is back. that the week after? Yeah. I have that's going to be Second Tuesday of the month. I'm I have I'm one more be... quick thing. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, Sir, go ahead, Alan. <laughs> I'm going to be in Portugal at the Dance World Cup, so I will not be able to join next week. Was that We're all going to pretend we didn't hear oh, that. Oh, the dance. Now, are you performing, Alan? Dance. So, no, my dear, please. we got to make sure that we do Arch on a week that Alan is guaranteed to be here. <laughs> well, he's not. Even if he was here, he doesn't have to participate if he doesn't want to. So, but he's going to do the extreme distro hop. Okay, right. Alan, it's now one minute past eight. Start. <laughs> 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 and, and bearing in mind, this is going to be one o'clock in the morning, so he's going to be two. <laughs> well, I mean, anyway. for all we know, he could do it for the European edition oh, on yeah. a Core Two Duo laptop. <laughs> That's awesome. Is that payback for the Chrome OS challenge that he presented? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the, the one that he never showed up for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, hey, there, hey, Rocco, sorry. Go ahead, Bill. There's one more thing that everybody needs to know if you're going to do this. If you're going to use a VM, their release notes tell you to use a new VM. Don't use it in an existing VM. Create a new one specifically for Open I think I just saw my power flicker. That's not good. Uh oh. All right. Um, look, there's some news lately in the Linux world that I know that every single person here wants to. Okay, maybe not every single person, but most 99% of the people want to uh, talk about. But before we do, let's remember that there are people behind all of this. And there are decisions that are made, and not everybody is involved in those decisions. People work for companies. Companies make decisions. But people uh, are not to blame. Certainly, you know, not every individual that works for a company is to blame for decisions. Alan, how are you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I think I just heard the bus. <laughs> Way to go, Would you like bro. to preface anything before we start talking? For example, you're yeah, right. I, hang on, Joshua. Hang on. 
so can I give you just a brief background, right? Yes. So Ubuntu has existed for 15 years, and in all that time, there's been a 32-bit and a 64-bit install. And over the last few years, there have been repeated discussions on various developer mailing lists in the public about whether uh, Ubuntu should continue to uh, publish 32-bit um, software. And there's two parts to that. One is whether we publish ISO images that you can install from. And the second part is whether there are even 32-bit packages in the archive. Now, the first part was stopped before we did the last LTS. So from 1804 onwards, there is no 32-bit ISO. And the proposal that's being suggested or was announced over the over just a couple of days ago is to say that the plan is for 1910 to stop publishing the 32-bit Intel packages in the archive. And that has caused quite a lot of conversation on the internet. Um, but that's the background, is it was part of a longer discussion, but suddenly the whole internet has found out about it. It wasn't just um, a flippant decision. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love 32-bit as well, Nate. Uh, in fact, it was actually 32-bit puppy that I was testing today, so um, <laughs> I felt that was appropriate. So, yeah, that's the background. And then there was discussion. Um, so Over to you, Rock. before we go any further, um, there may or may not be things that you're more than welcome to talk about it and you're more than welcome to ask questions, right. but there may be or may not be things that can be answered for those questions. Yeah. So there, right. have at it, go to okay. it. Okay. Okay. So this goes into question of the recent article that was recently sh shown on my newsfeed that when I first woke up this morning, well, what is the, is this not? I mean, how uh, Linux gaming and all that with Steam saying no more Steam client for Ubuntu, and Ubuntu being the most one of the most popular distros out there for quote new users and users in general of Linux. Well, to to put some background to this, not supporting 32-bit packages would stop certain programs from running because they are dependent on 32-bit. Oh, yeah packages and that includes steam and wine and a few others and that would break many things so games are a particularly interesting topic because um when you think about all the things that are in the ubuntu archive they're all open source all the stuff that's in the open in the archive and we build it every release yeah that software gets built new versions come out bug fixes and so on games are very different Games are predominantly proprietary and predominantly the developer puts a build of their game online somewhere, whether it's Steam or wherever, it doesn't really matter. They put that build online and they will often never touch it again. There are tons of games out there where the developer has written the game and then considers it done, puts it online, never touches it again. And they may have published this game long ago, like 10 years ago, and that game may only have a 32-bit version. And trying to convince those thousands of developers that, hey, yo, we don't support 32-bit anymore. You need to go and dust off the source code for your game you wrote 10 years ago and rebuild it for 64-bit. The question they would ask is, what's in it for me? Why would I do that? Um, and you, know, you, can't, you can't tell them there'll be more customers because their game might be old and crusty and not particularly interesting anymore. But the problem is for people who've already bought that game or people who buy that game now or are interested in buying that game, they may not be able to play it if the support 32-bit support libraries aren't there. That's the big problem. And it, but it's not just games. Games are like a headline thing, but there's plenty of other applications where this, this could be a problem. So that, that's the problem. Yes. But that's not um, Ubuntu's fault. You've just made a decision that, that suits your yeah. timeline and all the rest of it. So whilst, yes, there's people that have jumped up and put petitions online to say, please don't do it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you can't be held responsible for all of these packages out there. And as somebody just said in chat, so many other distributions have already dropped and stopped making 32-bit ISOs. Have they also stopped including the 32-bit ISOs? 
Oh, sorry, the 32-bit so library. Different distros do it differently. Different distros do it differently. But what some distros have done is they keep a limited set of 32-bit support libraries around in the archive so that games can games and other applications, like let's call them 32-bit applications, can still run and can have all the support libraries installed. So that's what some do. Red Hat do that. There's like 2,000 i686 packages in the Red Hat archive. Um, Arch does it. I think there's 280 32-bit packages in the Arch repository. So, yeah, this is a thing people do, is they often do have 32-bit libraries hanging around. Now, someone mentioned Steam and Valve and some big pronouncement. If you if you look at those tweets from Pierre Lou at, at, at Valve, there was like a sequence of tweets that went out, and one of them was that they would no longer support 1910. Um, and, yeah, that that would be a problem like if uh, if i was a user on ubuntu 1904 for example mm -hmm. and i wanted to continue playing my games yeah that'd be a problem if they upgraded to 1910 and games no longer worked that would be a frustrating experience so that i can see why valve might you know make this like knee-jerk announcement a couple of days after we put our announcement out. So, uh, you know, it, it seems perfectly reasonable that they would say that. Mm -hmm. So, so, Eric, you wanted to say something, mate. You had your hand up, sorry. Yeah, uh, I mean, I know this is a big shock to all of us, but the internet freaked out at this news. One of the things that I, I think is being overlooked in, in some of the media that I've been looking at is the fact that 1804 is still around. 1804 still has 32-bit support, and not only will it be around for the usual five, but I think correct me if i'm wrong but i think 1804 actually has 10 years of support only if you pay for it though so there's well okay, there's so five years the usual five and then and, right. and then five years of extended support. yes and 1804 is an option like you could potentially put an lts on. I, I run the lts here so people could do that that's for sure um but what some people like to do is especially people who play games is they like the very latest kernel the very latest video yes. the very latest of everything and so they use the latest version of Ubuntu um, so I can see why people who are can someone fix the person, chair yeah like who is creating please. on the chair <laughs> I, don't know. I think it's uh, mute yourself if you're not talking so I could see why people like might be frustrated at that at the thought that um you know, I'm I'm on 1904. If I upgrade, my games break. You know, 1804 is an option, and there are other options as well. Like potentially, we could do some kind of containerization of Steam, or we could make a snap of Steam, or something like that. There are multiple options, um, and I don't know how well all of those have been explored because they're not all part of the team that I work on. But yeah, there are numerous options. 1804 is one of them. Big pod. Yeah. If I may uh, ask, um, uh, the dropping of 32 bit that would be a probably mostly corporate decision for not spending so much money. Am I right? Because that, uh, because supporting something like that is kind of using money if not many people are using it. So I don't work on the financial side of Canonical, um, but it's not unreasonable to think that if you're building all of your archive for 32-bit systems and 64-bit systems, that's twice as many builds that you're doing for every package that you publish, right? So if there are binary packages and you build Firefox for 30, for 64-bit and you build Firefox for 32-bit, you've got two builds, two sets of resources. So there's just the build system itself is going to, you know, takes up a lot of time building both of those packages. And if you multiply that by the hundreds of packages there are in the archive, yeah, there's a there's a financial cost associated with that. And then there's the engineering cost of a developer, you know, making sure that that i386 or the 32-bit package works and fixing any 32-bit specific bugs. I mean, there's not so much of those these days, I don't think. But um, I don't know if that was the main driver. I know there are other factors as well, like... The number of 32-bit systems is d 
diminishing fast. They represent a, ver a very small proportion of the installs, 32-bit systems. Um, and also, some of the security mitigations for the recent CPU security issues don't appear for 32-bit systems. So you're left with a potentially insecure CPU. And should we be providing software that runs on, you know, in, in an insecure mode on CPUs? I, I don't know. So, um, so I think that's part of it. Tyler, go so, ahead. So one uh, concern I saw that came across, I, I, I don't know too much about it, but as far as like Valve and specifically gaming, that uh, they're, they've been unable to sub, uh, implement or ship with their own 32-bit versions of the graphic stack libraries that they need to access. Is, is that one of the barriers they're running into? So, I mean, it would conflict video drivers. With the system. I mean, yeah. It, video drivers are obviously an important part of the gaming experience. Yeah. Um, but... Um, I, I don't think that's, I mean, that's, a, and that is a factor, but I don't think that's necessarily uh, um, the biggest problem. Um, and I think it would be possible to bundle the 32 bit driver in the 64 bit package. So you could actually just install one package and get both. I think okay. that's technically possible. Okay. They, don't, they don't have to be broken out into two separate packages. Okay. Um, Eric? So I'm, <clears throat> I'm not intimately well versed with the portable packages like snaps and flat packs and things. But my understanding is they include all of the requirements, libraries, things like that, that you would need to run the software. So you mentioned the idea of maybe snapping steam or something like that, or even some other 32 bit library. Like what came to mind was the NVENC encoder for FFmpeg not being included in 1904 and there was a snap for that where you could install it and then you had it. So is, is that potentially a way that seems like a pretty straightforward path to mitigating some of this? Like if there's a specific use case, you know, like there's a library that is just wine has to have or something like that, or am I just not quite understanding how that works? No, no, that's totally right. The, 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 the interesting thing about snaps is that they, um, we build them on 1804 generally. I mean, you can build them on 1604, but if you build them on 1804, then you have access to the 1804 archive, which includes all the 32 bit packages. So you could build a, a snap or some kind of container that's run on, built on 1804, and therefore would contain whatever the version of the libraries that are available on the 1804 archive in there and that container could be taken to a 1904 system or some future system and run on that so yeah that's the basic premise of all of these potential solutions whether it's lexd containers or snaps or flat packs or whatever like they're all very similar um but there are some technical challenges to that like how do you pass through the gpu to the container mm -hmm. and how do you make sure that all your, your joysticks and other interfaces and how are, you, how are you going to do QA? How do you make sure that this vast library of games from the past are going to work when they're containerized? Because they've never been containerized before. So, you know, they might freak out when they're inside a container and just not work mm -hmm. properly. And we know that software does sometimes do that. So it, um, my, the, maybe, the maybe I just, yeah. just to, just to add on to the end of it though. So today, when you think about all of the different variations of Linux that, companies have to support like a game developer that's publishing a game to me maybe a containerized version of something is actually easier to deal with because it's a known entity oh. versus I, i'm well, going to be optimistic and say that there's well, probably bit, going to be, yeah yeah my, my only concern will be and i don't know enough about it all but a a vulnerability comes along and then fixes are applied so if no one is maintaining 32-bit libraries anymore and you've got this great snap package that's working today, but a particular library, and I don't know if this can happen with a library, but gets an attack and you have to issue a CSV against the whatever it is, how, who would maintain that, if that makes sense, if, if Ubuntu are no longer doing it? And would it then fall over or would you not worry about it because hey not many people get attacked on linux anyway well the interesting thing is there are 
there are not there are security issues in packages in most Linux distributions that have yet to be addressed because the whole thing for the most part is community maintained, right? Mm -hmm. And so someone has to do the work. And at the moment it's canonical doing the work predominantly to look after the uh, the Ubuntu archive. Someone else could do that in the future. If we if we certainly do go through with all of this and we step away from x86 in 1910, potentially somebody else could build those packages and then they would be responsible for the security updates. It's not it's not actually hard to build 32-bit versions. You know, it's not it's not a hard thing to do. You can write a script to do it in a couple of hours to rebuild everything in Ubuntu. That's not difficult. The the tricky part is maintaining it and having the resources and build system and the hosting as well. Like it's 152 gig of devs. Like who's going to host that? But where are you going to host it? Right. Mm. So at the moment, for the last 15 years, Canonical have been hosting that. And, you know, the point at which we say, mm, maybe we don't want to be hosting that anymore. And everyone freaks out because we're no longer, you know, potentially going to be hosting this portion of the archive. Um, people kind of forget that we have been doing that and maintaining it and had engineers who are paid to look after that stuff for the last 15 years. Yeah. But, you know, people only care about stuff when it goes away. Mm -hmm. Thomas? So my one question is, um, supposing somebody, third party, or maybe even canonical, um, were to build those 32 packages in such a way that you could add them in, will there potentially be a sort of sanctioned way that you could add those 32-bit libraries in yourself if you wanted or needed to? Because I'm sure there will be somebody out there who has to run 1910 and needs those 32-bit libraries. I'm sure that'll probably pop up at some point. So that's no different than having like any third-party repository, like right. you know, on Debian. They used to be, um, they still are, very strict about the license under which software goes into the Debian archive. And so people had external repositories for things like Codex. And that was always the case that you had the Debian multimedia repository in order to get the Codex. And what if there was an 32-bit uh, repository that you add if you need these 32-bit uh, files? But and, and that's all possible. All of this, like hypothetically speaking, is technically possible. It's just about who's going to look after it and who's going to host it like i said 152 gig of of data okay you could argue that that's not a huge amount of data but when you've got a million machines all getting software updates hitting that uh, and when i say a million i'm just figuratively saying a lot of machines and there are a lot of machines out there running ubuntu um ps it's way more than a million um <laughs> they're, then they're going to hit that machine and eat a lot of traffic and who's going to pay for that yep so regardless of if we, you know, if you have them in a repo or you would have them in snap packages at some point, somebody is going to have to maintain those libraries. So right. Right. I don't know if exactly. snaps would be an answer to that because regardless, somebody's going to have to maintain it. Well, well. The bonus of it being uh, a snap is snaps are built on 1804 and we've already got a commitment to maintain the packages in 1804. At least for a couple for of years. years for eight, for, well, for 10 years, Mark has committed to 10 years for 1804. <laughs> um, so at the point at the point when it hits 2023 and the five years is up, those files don't all just disappear, right? They're still there. Um, uh, but we only provide like support, extended support for people who are Ubuntu Advantage customers. So building a snap, built on 1804 we'll build on libraries we're already committed to maintaining mm -hmm. so how does this affect gaming or any of these programs on a long-term basis because you know we continually want more people to come to Linux we talk about how we have more games now than we ever have and then it looks like in the future we're kind of like going to be limited so how does that affect so, our trajectory? So here's a question for you, Rocco. Here's a question for you, Rocco. What if we were having this conversation in two years' time? Before, So 
we're all preparing for the LTS that's going to happen next year, 2020. That'll be the 2004 release of Ubuntu. No, no idea what the code name is. In two years' time, we're going to be preparing for the 2022 uh, LTS. Now, let's say we magically make all of this problem go away, right? We carry on maintaining 32-bit packages for another two years, right? We're just going to have this same problem again because those games that were built 10 years ago or 15 years ago are still there. They're still 32-bit programs. People still want to run them. So it doesn't matter how far you push this out, whether it's two years or four years, at some point, someone's got to make a decision about what we do with these 32-bit libraries. And mm. someone has to step up and maintain them. And at the moment, it's us. I think, I think everybody understands that. I think a lot of what people are saying, and you, you said that before that all these discussions on these email groups were uh, out in the public. But I think everybody's perception is Canonical have come along and said, right, okay, it's June, come October, goodbye. I mean, you've got four months to sort it out. Whereas I think you'd still be in exactly the same position if Canonical said, okay, do you know what? We're going to get rid of them in 2022. You've got two years to sort it out. And everybody would be merrily going along their way, minding their own business. And then at the end of two years, they'd be going, oh, we forgot to sort it out. Oh, it's all Canonical's fault because they've stopped it. <laughs> Uh, and and question. the same thing is happening with Apple. <clears throat> mm. I, I saw a Apple comment come up exactly in, the, uh, in the chat about how the 16-bit games that are out there, and I'm fairly certain there aren't a lot of 16-bit libraries out there, but there are emulators for running those games. Mm -hmm. how, how difficult would it be to create an emulator to run the 32-bit games like we have emulators for the 16-bit games. Or an emulation layer. Well, you'd still uh, have to have developers working on that, regardless of... It, it, it's a matter of resources, really. I mean, or, let's be honest. Maybe not even resources, but a matter of wanting to put them resources that, somewhere. That, that, that's what I mean. You like know? Targeted resources, people to actually, like, I always said, to maintain it. Like, like you said, Canonical has been taking care of it for the last 15 years. Somebody's going to have to take care of it. Who would would an emulator though be so, less work than maintaining the entire suite of thirty two bit libraries? I guess it would depend on I'm how not, deep not that you need. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah. Sorry, I, d I don't think you necessarily need all of the thirty two bit libraries. You certainly need a chunk of them. And Red Hat have figured out they needed about a thousand, and Arch have figured out they needed about two hundred or so. How many Somewhere are there? Do you know? In, in between those. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. But it's 152 gig of binaries and source code. <laughs> and uh, Alan, you just... Yeah. Do, account, do account, if you like. Uh, Alan, you did mention that you that Apple did this also before you guys or something like that? They're doing it. Yeah. And so Valve are in the same position with Apple as they are with Linux. So Apple are moving to 64-bit only. And they've given not a huge amount of notice um and so <laughs> i i would imagine people at valve are a little bit annoyed that you know oh two people are doing this to us you know <laughs> yeah, well okay so by the same token it, 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 must, it must show people how difficult it is to maintain because valve isn't a small organization so why don't valve go do you know what we're going to save the world we're going to support 32-bit libraries from now on why don't they do it? Because it's hard and it's expensive. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And it's not a problem on Windows, which is where their major market share is. Right. I, I'm sure Unless, if they really uh, wanted to, they could maintain just what's needed for Steam and put that in their repository or whatever. But it isn't just that. It is, or, like I said, there's other programs as well. It's not just Valve. It's not just Steam. Th th uh, Things like Lutris will now have a problem. Yeah, Things wine, that rely, you know, wine. many other programs will have issues. It's not just theme, and that's right. I think the biggest the one thing I issue. would say is this hasn't actually happened yet. Like I would imagine, nobody in our audience is running nineteen ten right now, and even if you are, even if you're that kind of person, okay, <laughs> it hasn't happened. Like um, you still yeah. have. You still have those 32-bit packages on your 1910 system. So the sky hasn't fallen quite yet. Um, and we've seen a lot of discussion, and obviously here's some more. Um, so no doubt when 
uh, all the canonical people uh, come back from their weekend on Monday morning and read all their email, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so the discussions will be had yet. Sorry, Big Pod, what did you want? Good feedback, everyone. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I say that even if Steam oh. supports the base library, 32 bit libraries they need, then all the 32 bit games they host will need to support, will need to either use those libraries or don't use or make their own repositories to host libraries they need. That's the problem with, um, with Valve having their own repository for 32 bit libraries. Adam, you wanted to say something? Or did you? <laughs> did I? I uh, okay, I guess I'll say something. Um, this kind of sucks, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll bow out. I've been listening to music. I'm, you guys have fun. All right. Uh, All right. So I, just wanted... I have a question real quick. Um, Alan, you mentioned something about, you know, if you're running a 16 or a 1910 system right now, with, if you're that type of person, you still have those 32-bit libraries. Let's say you are that type of person and you keep that 1910 system running until 1910 has its stable release. I'm assuming you would still have those 32-bit libraries in your on your system. They just wouldn't be in the archive anymore. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I guess I guess you wouldn't get any updates if you had some 32-bit libraries installed on a 19 system today. Then, um, and you would have to have installed them because a, a stock install of of 1910 64-bit doesn't ship with 32-bit stuff. So. If you had installed Steam, for example, or Lutris, or any other thing that pulled it, or Wine, or whatever, um, then what you would get is no more updates. Like, if this happened, right. and they switch off, it will, what will mean is no more 32-bit packages get built, so you won't get any updates. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Okay. But so everything I should still keep continuing to work, yeah? Or is there uh, some correlation? I wouldn't guarantee... I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I'm wondering, because is there some it, correlation where a, a library gets updated that's like 64 bit and is part of Ubuntu 2004? And because it's been changed and because it's been updated, the 32 bit that would normally have chatted to it suddenly goes, Oh, my avenue to talk has gone because they've changed this. And I, I noticed it an awful lot on Clementine when I was trying to spam clementine to a particular application they changed one element of uh, clementine and i can't remember what it was now but what somebody had written to talk to now didn't understand what the new thing was asking for so you might have it and it might work but eventually things will start to crumble and the walls will break down and yeah it will it just won't go work. wrong joshua <laughs> um, go uh, ahead adam maybe. sorry i um I, I could have totally missed somebody saying this because I wasn't paying attention, but doesn't uh, snaps and flat packs kind of like solve this problem? Mm. Yes and no. Yeah, we did that about 10 minutes. Yeah, yet. we did that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. all right. Are yeah. right, you guys just have fun? Just watch I'm it just, later. Just, yeah, just, just, watch it. Fun. Although, just rewind just, a little bit. Go back to listen okay. to the music, Adam. Can I say something real quick? Yeah, this might be sort of a ranty sort of thing, but I've noticed like within the past couple years or so that Whenever something major happens with Ubuntu, that um, it ends up biting them in the butt in the end, like with Wayland in the past, as well as other things that sort. Of, and those co also co coincided with major Windows decisions that could spur on people who would who would have wanted to switch over to Linux but didn't due to these sort of misgivings. Uh, I'm, I'm probably sounding like Chris Fisher right now saying this at, at this point, but um, it bears repeating. Like sometimes, sometimes these decisions do impact. Uh, and I mean, even though we don't really have any mind share among normals or any outside of technological nerd sanction area, what we are, it's, I mean, it is disconcerting that our spread of Linux as the, as the, better operating system could be inhabit inhibited by some sort of decision that yeah. may not be well, prepared. Look, JJ, it's That's, unfortunate it's that something like this, a decision like this has to be made, but at the end of the day... I understand why it has to yeah, be Yeah, at the end of the day, Canonical is a company that wants to make money, That's or they won't be in business, you know what I mean? Understood. So there but are decisions that have to be made. 
Yeah, but this coinciding with the expiration of Windows 7 support, do you... Coincidental. Conspiracy theory. I agree that it couldn't come at a worse time, but like I said, I mean, what are you going to do about it? I mean, pretty mm. much nothing. I, can, I well, kind of... I, I can see the point how you might draw a line between um, certain things happening and that being detrimental to the external perspective of Linux as a whole, right? And I can see why people might say, well, oh, I was going to try Linux, but I heard about this whole drama around whatever, and so I didn't. Um, I'm not convinced that there are great swathes of people around the world who have that attitude. I think there might be a few. There certainly might be a few. I agree with you that there might be people out there who say, uh, yeah, I was uh, I was looking around at alternatives because my friend mentioned Linux and I looked around and there was all this drama and there was all these news articles about how they were breaking things. And so I thought, nah, maybe not. that's not for me. Yeah, sure. I'm sure there will be some people who do that. Um, but the flip side is I think there's plenty more pragmatic people or people who will go and seek more opinion and not make knee-jerk reactions based on a news article that came out two days ago. Yep. Well, see, that's the thing. We don't have all of the information yet. This isn't a final decision yet. This is it could be reversed regardless if if it would be a final decision. It could still be reversed. So I don't think it's time to freak out. I think it's just time to talk about it. But, you know, hey, at least we're talking mm -hmm. about it now. So so people like I think, Alan. I think, what, I think uh, one of the pieces of feedback that we've heard loud and clear was that perhaps more testing could have been done. Perhaps um, more dialogue could have been had. Perhaps mm -hmm. this wasn't the right time. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. There's lots of, like, you know, once all the dust is settled, whatever happens, I think there's certainly room for us to go away and have a long, hard think about the way that we announce things and the way that we, exp like, assume everyone has seen all these mailing list threads from the last five years. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and the fact yeah. that people are asking such, you know, sensible questions now, like, yeah, sure. Maybe, maybe the FAQ could have been bigger. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe we could have put a video out. I don't know. Yes. More marketing, more what, marketing. What, yeah. Well, I think, I think what you're doing right now is important, you know, Popey being here to express, explain this and, Maybe not the whole world is going to see Big Daddy Linux live, but come on, Eric. We, I know. Well, most of the world, <laughs> you know, a significant but, portion. Be clear, exactly. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not doing this as Linux part of my world. job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm a guy. Not, I'm, uh, yes, sorry, Colin. Colin, go ahead. I'm not doing this as. A, I'm not doing this to represent, like, canonical professionally, um, because it is. 3 a.m. Saturday night, and I'm not paid to be here right, right. Now. But I feel it's important, yeah. and you are my friends, and I feel like Aww. you're going to. I'm going to tell you what I think. Yeah, and yeah. we but really, not... really appreciate that, Alan. It's very fun. No, it, we no lies. Up. We we no. do appreciate the fact that you come on here because you you know that you're going to get <laughs> questions like that. <laughs> um, Colin, well, go ahead. I'm not I'm not a gamer myself. I don't understand the whole th – well, I sort of understand how it goes. But um, for me, how long 64-bit been around for? Why doesn't Valve get people to make games in 64-bit and, and start it and move forward? I mean, how long are we going to – They could. They could They could certainly – there's a couple of things they could do. They could, they could push a 64-bit version of the client, but that wouldn't help because from Valve's perspective, every game is sacred. Like, if, if you're a customer of Valve's and you buy a game on Steam, there is a commitment there that that game will continue to work. And you could buy a new PC in 10 years' time. Like, you, you stop playing games, right? You're a teenager, you bought loads of games on Steam, and then you stop playing games. You pack away your PC, and then you get a life, and you get a girlfriend, and you have babies, and then, like, 10 years' time... I'm like, you don't get disposable income. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Please. <laughs> you killed Eric. You, you, <laughs> you 
buy a PC because you've got a disposable income and then you launch your Steam account, every single one of those games you bought 10 years ago should still work. <laughs> that's the commitment. And, and that's, that's hard to do um on linux because you know things are a bit of a moving target and that's why there's when you look at steam on linux there's this steam runtime which contains a bunch of libraries that makes this stuff work um and steam makes assumptions that a bunch of 32-bit libraries are going to be there but the problem is you are never going to convince those game developers from 10 15 years ago to go back and rebuild those games and make 64-bit binaries that's never going to happen like what some of them right so there there's no, no way. So there's no way that Steam could sort of um, a once-off port that that could uh, convert 32 to 64 or anything like that. So no, everything they don't have the source, don't have the source code. Those games. Speaking of old games, I mean, currently right now, Microsoft is in the is like is key is like a key player in this and trying to uh, do backward compatibility with its old games. I know this is a console analogy, but I mean, it's possible. I'm, I'm, it's possible they they are supporting old Xbox games all the way to the original Xbox on their current Xbox. Platform. Not all. A significant Not portion. All. No, there's 300, right. they 300 the stack. They, they control the stack and there's like three hardware platforms. Not an array of hardware platforms with different GPUs and CPUs. Like They right. have a lot of control. Much like Apple, they have a lot of control. Whereas uh, Valve uh, uh, Alan, Steam on anything. Is this kind of the same question that comes up with Microsoft and about legacy stuff? Like, how, how long do you support legacy? Like, really? I mean, is that a fair right. question to ask? Um, well, you know, old, old Linux binaries tend to still work uh, if you've got all the support libraries kicking around. Like, you know, people find a way to make this stuff work um, on Linux. But that's that that's a lot harder if the libraries just aren't there. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. if libraries go away, these yeah. applications just don't work anymore. Okay, so here's a really stupid question. Again, I'm, you guys know I'm not technical. So we've got Ubuntu, which was originally based off of Debian. Why can't people who are running Ubuntu use the Debian 32-bit libraries? Ooh. Are they just totally alien? I mean, we so, probably could, to be brutally honest. If there was a specific repository that had all the 32-bit binaries in it, you could probably very easily just plop right into your sources.list, import the keys, call it a day. It's just... Don't do that. No one dedicated <laughs> repository with those 32-bit binaries in it, as far as I'm aware. And if I'm wrong about that, please correct me. So let's just run Gen yeah, 2 and build everything from source. <laughs> no, nah, no, man, no. Okay, nah. Alan, Alan wanted to say something, wanted to correct you. you can Building build a Linux kernel once a day is enough for me. <laughs> okay. So the there, you can get, um, I'm not a developer. I, I don't know this stuff in, 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 intricately either. So I would just say we have always had a policy that it's not a good idea to add Debian, upstream Debian packages to your Ubuntu system because the packages are built against a different version of libc. Fundamentally, there may be other libraries they're built against as well. And you can just break your system. If a new package comes into the Debian archive and you pull something in from Debian that is older than what you have or newer than what you have, it it can just break. And so it's a completely unsupported, uncharted territory. It might work just the same as, you know, adding the pop OS repository on top of Ubuntu or, or adding like some Linux mint thing on top of Ubuntu. It might work, but you're in uncharted territory. And yeah, it's it, not it, something it like somebody from Cornwall really... speaking to somebody from Newcastle, uh, Joshua. <laughs> I love the way you, I love the way you explain Hello? things. Ed. Joshua, you wanted to say something earlier. Uh, I didn't want to say anything, actually. But if I was going to say something, then what I've been that besides, with the Steam migrating away from Ubuntu, then it wouldn't have been that, to be honest. I think that we're fine if it isn't Ubuntu. Because some people say that Fedora is faster, and, you know, there's proof of that, and it's just a controversial argument. 
I don't really think that if Steam goes away, the gaming world for Linux is going to throw up. I think that everything's going to be fine. I think it's a little bit of a crack in the wall, but I think that everybody will get used to it. Uh, um, I'm just going to say uh, Valve does a lot more work than people seem to think. Nate? Yeah, they contribute a lot to wine. A oh, yeah. lot. So like if- I just saw an article where Va- uh, Valve has an employee contributing to KWIN, which is re- pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Nate? So they've, they've done a lot of work um, in order to generate um, games on various desktops. And they've, they've contributed all over the place, like kernel, drivers, everywhere. They're, um, they're quite prolific. I, I, which, this, this thing about um, them, Steam, say, uh, Valve saying they're not going to support 1910 as an official like repo, I'm not sure how much effect that will actually have. Because right now, most of their customers on Linux are on Ubuntu. And I don't, I mean, this could be the arrogance of, of Canonical coming across here, but if if we do this right in 1910 and we don't screw it up, I don't think the whole world is just going to suddenly flush their Ubuntu CDs down the toilet and switch away to whichever distro you think is better. Uh, people don't generally tend to do that. Some people do, but the vast majority don't. I They'll watched a YouTube out. video this week of somebody doing that just because of this decision. Yeah. So there are people yeah, out there, but most people that. won't. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> right, but it hasn't happened. I know. Like, it's like, that's it. I'm switching. So Why? you're saying that the Ubuntu uh, CDs will become like the AOL CDs of the next generation? Right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we haven't used yeah, a CD anymore. Nate, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask. So uh, forgive my ignorance because there's a lot of things I don't know. But um, is it possible for Steam to pull some of those necessary libraries into Steam and take that burden off of Ubuntu? I mean, is that is that possible? Okay. <laughs> yes, so yes. Then, yeah, that yeah. is possible. So, so then, so I, I'm just I'm asking because I just don't know how I don't know how that all works. So so then it would be possible. So then it's it's really we're we're all we're all getting up in arms about nothing really. Well, no, if, if that's, it, well, that's, all we really do is just make it's your, whether they would want to do that, right? Yeah, technically, lots of well, things well, are possible. But, but it would and be it would be important to them. Uh, the way so, so, so I don't, um, um, God, what's the word for it? They had to port the Steam client from i386 to x or to amd64 because it is in uh 32 bit when you go download it last i checked and they it could be that there is a 64 bit version and they've just been redistributing it and you know not saying oh this is actually 64 bit i know in the repository it's not the client it's not the client the the yeah the, and to be honest is there really anything that 32-bit does better than 64-bit? Like, really anything? Uh, yeah, memory footprint. Exists. <laughs> there are yeah. thousands of 32-bit games that exist. That's, yeah, that's, I know. You know. I'm just saying, like, in a, if you were to go and write something, and you were to you know, sit there and debate with yourself whether you were going to compile it as a 32 or 64-bit only, is there really anything that 32-bit do does better? Other than no, support. game developers don't do that. A game developer I is know. focused on their game and the you know the uh, the experience of playing that game and marketing their game and you know all the other aspects of releasing their game. Yeah, whether it's thirty two bit or sixty four bit is really just a button press it, when they export yeah. the game. Now yeah, it's possible that. That Valve could in uh, Valve could incentivize people to make 64-bit binaries. They might say, hey, we'll push you up the chart um, to ex- give you more exposure if you made a 64-bit binary. That's possible to, in order to encourage people, push people towards it, because they know with the Mac switching to 64-bit only, you're going to appear on the charts if you're a 64-bit game. And so that's certainly something that could be done to encourage people, but unfortunately, that needed to be done years ago and yeah. unfortunately we are out of time <laughs> we could go on we could go on for another hour about this subject but i would just urge everybody to just cool down and let Breathe. it play out 
yeah, breathe. You know, let it play yeah. out. No, this decisions haven't been made. All decisions are reversible. We'll work something out. Uh, like I said, I did see a guy with a video this week who said, I'm, I uninstalled every Ubuntu on, off of my machines. Every one of them because of this. Okay, well, good for you, dude. You know, that's all I can say. <laughs> right, but that's so, so sad that it's got to that state. It's, you know, that's it's disappointing that something we have done, and this is something we have done, right, has caused people to be that frustrated that they feel they have to wipe it and move to something else. And that's that's very sad for us. That's deeply sad for us. And we need to, like, take that on board. Yeah, but the trouble is, you guys just waking up in the morning is enough to get somebody that upset. <laughs> you can't avoid this it. This is true, Dave. This is true. All right. Everybody just gets existing. A, yeah. Everybody gets a last word. PZ. Um, I'd just like to thank again Alan Pope for coming along here this evening. And he knew he was going to get some stick. But look, the man is there. It's 3 a.m. in the UK. So uh, more power to you, Alan. Thank you very much indeed. And Rocco, as always, great show. Love coming here. Eris, last word. I would just like to thank you for the stream, Rocco and Zeb and and Dan, um, uh, and also Alan Pope for coming here. It was it was an easy night for him, and I appreciate it. He came over. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, I had to unmute the mic. Uh, no, uh, the challenge sounded very interesting. I'm sorry I didn't get to participate with it. Uh, Alan, thank you for all the answers there, uh, you know, and a good discussion on uh, this thing. Like I said, it could be something. It could be a, uh, a tempest in a teapot. Who knows? Um, I'm now going to go and dive into my open SUSE install. Cross your fingers. Have fun. Matt, last word. Uh, Rago, thank you for putting on the show. Zeb and Dan for always helping. Always great to be here. Alan, Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. I know it's early, very, very early for you. Um, I don't think it's people. I, <laughs> I don't think people honestly understand how much you actually really do for the community. And yeah, yeah. Th thank you for taking the time to answer. I know some sticky questions and <laughs> whatnot, but it really is appreciated because e even not for just as a personal uh, takes on them, not, not as a canonical spokesman or employee or anything, but as your own take, it's nice to hear a, I don't want to say a developer kind of point of view from it. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? We know what but, you mean. So, uh, so thank you. Colin, last word, brother. Um, yep, was, uh, I enjoyed uh, watching you guys meeting each other last week. That was just absolutely awesome. And uh, I'd have to be probably on my bucket list to maybe for that to happen one day. So, and you're saying, Rocco, that uh, just don't go ahead and get rid of a bunt or anything like that. So you're saying no distro hopping at all? Or is that well, what you're saying? You can get rid of it with the <laughs> idea that it'll come back on. <laughs> Um, thanks for the show. This is always great. And Alan, it's always good to listen to from uh, your perspective. Um, I, I enjoy listening to what you say. So thanks for joining us this week. It was excellent. Um, and I'm looking forward to driving uh, to trying Open Mandriva. That should be interesting. Back on KDE Plasma again. Seems to be seems to be um, around me all the time. This lately is uh, Plasma. So who knows? I might get to like it. Tony, last word. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say thanks to you, Rocco, for doing it this week again. Um, it's a bit smoother than last time. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, also, I'd like to say thanks to Alan for being brave enough to come on here and take some of the flack. But it's good to know that you're willing to come on and to explain things to those of us that like myself perhaps don't understand exactly what it's all about but i don't game so it doesn't really matter to me um and as far as puppy linux goes i forgot to mention the most important thing that was the best thing about it single click <laughs> my man tony <laughs> alan let's yeah. <laughs> how much did you pay him for that one oh. don't does that don't <laughs> <laughs> Last word, brother. Um, 
Thank, uh, thank you everyone for the kind words. Um, I, I love coming here because this is like my Linux user group. I come up here, um, everyone else in the house is in bed and I can have a chat with you guys and you all know what I'm talking about. We're all nerding out together. It's just like a bunch of nerds sitting, chatting together and I appreciate all the kind words. Thank you very much. I don't take compliments very well, so um, thank you. Thank you very much and keep up the good work, everyone. Tyler. Thank you for doing this. I am glad to be back on a more regular basis uh, now that I'm not traveling as much. I already have Open Mandriva on the ThinkPad. Oh my right gosh. Wow. Wow. And, uh, wow. That was quick. <laughs> and I'm going to see if it's going to be replacing Kubuntu for me. Nice. Wow. <laughs> Nate. Hey, thanks again, Rocco, for doing this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pope, for being here. I, I always. Uh, I always appreciate when you're here. Um, and I, I enjoyed Puppy Linux. Gonna, I'm hoping to enjoy Open Mandriva and, uh, you know, looking forward to the future. I, I've updated here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, last word. 32 bit. All right. So um, thank you for having me on again. I'm sorry I wasn't on here for the past week or two, but I'm back now. Um, Alan thank, thank you for getting on here. Alan, thank you for getting on here and helping explain this. Um, as an Ubuntu fanboy myself, I probably won't be leaving even when 32-bit leaves. Um, just hopefully games will keep working afterwards. Um, and thank you, Rocco, for hosting. Um, this is about as close to a real lug as I can get. Um, check out DrogerOS. <laughs> DrogerOS.org. <laughs> yep, definitely. Uh, Dan. Last word. Thanks to Rocco and Zeb, and thanks for being back, Rocco. It's it's awesome. Um, <laughs> always always fun to be here with these guys. Um, thanks to everybody for for watching and uh, looking forward to Open Mandriva for the week. Should be interesting. Eric, last word. I'll echo Alan's statement. This is the only group of people I can speak with in a nerd you know, centric conversation that don't just want to walk away from me. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate and then, that. And uh, secondly, Mr. Pope may claim not to be a developer, but it was written on the internet this week that he is a developer by Phronix. So <laughs> then it must be therefore, true because it was on the internet. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> it's on the internet. Uh -oh, fire alert. It's funny you should bring that up. Eric because is never wrong. That was an awesome piece where you took the time to test all of those games. That was fantastic. Yeah, it really was. And, uh, and lastly, um, I'm just going to plug the new web series that uh, Rock is doing, the Linux Spotlight. Uh, oh, yeah. There's a new page on the uh, website for that with the first two episodes with uh, Zebedee and with Alan. Or, I'm sorry, Adam. <laughs> sorry, Adam. Next week's Adam's cat. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's uh, it's really uh, very entertaining and and well worth uh, watching. So thanks everyone. Have a good week. John, last word, brother. Well, like everybody else has said, thanks to Rocco and Zeb and everybody for putting this on. Thanks for Alan to come in and talk to us. It's nice to hear, you know, a real opinion on the world. <laughs> and to quote Zeb, if you don't have anything nice to say. Install Ubuntu Mate. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> Dave, that's for By the way, I run Arch. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Rocco, Zeb, Dan. You guys do an amazing job. Thank you, Alan, for being here. I, I cannot stress how wonderful it is to be here to talk to you guys, especially when I get to geek out with so many of the voices that I hear on my favorite podcasts each week. So thank you all. Bill, last word. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you, Zeb. Eric, thank you for doing all the stuff you're doing that no one will really see, but it's really, really great stuff and all the hard work you're doing. Popey, thank you so very, very much. You do so much. Sure. This stuff, the Snapcraft stuff, you put yourself out there. I appreciate it very much. Joshua, last word. So I uh, have a bit to talk about. Uh, I'm not going to make it too long. It was really nice to be here. Um, you know, I have a lot of people to thank Carlos. Thank you for, for bringing me here. I feel really comforted. Rocco, 
Rob, nice job. Applause for you. Puppy Linux, yeah. Um, that was pretty fun. Can't wait for Open Mandriva. My teacher likes that name. <laughs> Asked her which one was her favorite. Um, and uh, otherwise, besides that, we didn't get to talk about Moon Sim, so I'll show you how it's going to go real quickly without wasting too much time. So, just so you know, this is not Sim 4.0. It decided that it didn't like want to compile, so for now, some stuff is Sim 4.0, some isn't. But otherwise, uh, and last words, it was nice being with you guys, and I hope to be here next week. Peace out. Cool. Can you put your screen back off now? Thanks. All right, Adam, last word, brother. Uh, thanks for putting this on. I know I, um, I've i been here, you know, in, in the discussion, sure. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> it's good times. I appreciate I appreciate everything you guys do for the community and everything. And I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to playing Borderlands, so you okay. guys have fun. <laughs> Eric, last word. Well, enjoy playing Borderlands while you can before Popey just takes it all that joy away from us. <laughs> it's true. That's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm on it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Popey. I, I love you. But, yeah, I love uh, Rocco and Seb, thank you guys for, for hosting this. This is kind of my, my lug away from my lug. Um, the K Kansas City lug is... Uh, isn't really active anymore and and i try and make it out to to tyler's lug and lawrence as, as often as i can so it's nice to just come back sit sit back and and listen to a bunch of geeks nerd out but uh i'll tell you what if 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 more come if more articles come out like this one uh where, where steam and wine just are ready to rage quit i i think uh you know apple's not an option windows isn't an option and then you know forget that ubuntu thing but uh, so if that happens, I, I think you'll find me on an island somewhere just selling drinks. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where I'm getting to in my career. <laughs> Paul, last word. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Great show tonight. Prophetic. All right, JJ, last word. Thanks very much, Rocco, for the show and, and also Zeb and all the other people who are behind this as well. Really do appreciate Al, Al, Mr. Alan Pope by the, uh, for being here. By the way, his last name is Misnomer. He is not. He is only one individual. He is not a Pope of, of Ubuntu, so just want to put that out there. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I just want to ex also expand that um, he, I, I'm going to assume that he's going to discuss this with his other friends on his podcast, a bunch of podcasts, the next episode, correct? Uh, we did on the last episode. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Nice okay. <laughs> okay. And also, I want to push that if anybody else wants to continue the conversation after the show, there is the uh, Biddle um, Discord that is bigdaddinglanes.com slash Discord. Um, and... Uh, uh, really thanks and hopefully this gets worked out Steve last word uh, as always thank you to everybody I want to thank everybody here for being and I don't think it would have been any other way being civil with Alan and uh, you know uh, we are a great group of uh, people I love being here big pod last word <laughs> Uh, thank you, Henry, and thank you guys for watching. But Alan, right now I got to scold you. <laughs> Where's another Snapcraft, Snapcraft live stream? I've been waiting for those. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'll get on that right now. Vash, last word. Uh, thanks for the stream as always, Rocco. And uh, thanks, Comcast, for the uh, awesome internet stability. It's, it's been amazing tonight. I noticed so, uh, you were disconnecting and reconnecting. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that wasn't me. <laughs> Sorry, brother. All right. That'll do it for us. Um, thank you all for showing up. I want to thank uh, UpCloud for sponsoring Big Dad Linux. And until next week, long live Linux. Till next week. See ya. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah, everybody. Bye. Later. Well, See, ya. See you next week. Long Can't wait. See you soon. My first love.